Good morning, North Boulevard. What a wonderful Sunday morning this is, the beginning of fall break. We got folks who are out, folks who are traveling, but the energy is still really, really high in this place because you understand that God is still worthy of our praise. Even when we are allowed to take a break, our God doesn't take a break. And um, we're thankful to be in His presence, thankful to be in the presence of one another. Welcome to you, Boulevard Online, wherever you're watching, wherever you are in the world. We're thankful that you are here. Again, the energy in this place is still really high, even though, you know, the volunteers, they lost yesterday. Um, but, but have no fear, Alabama did too. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Tide fans. I was just happy with that. Just had to say that. Just had to start the day. Uh, with that. But seriously, we know we have a lot of folks who are traveling uh, today, so I ask that you would keep them in your prayers uh, as they travel throughout the week. Uh, some of you might be traveling later on today throughout uh, this, the rest of this week, praying that you are safe, particularly those uh, who are headed south to Florida. There seems to be another hurricane uh, on its way through uh, that uh, state. And uh, we have some folks, I know Sean Frazier, his family are in Florida, John Magnus and his family, they're already in Florida, so we want to uh, pray that God would, would, would keep them, keep everyone there safe. We have a New Day Momentum Conference in Florida uh, at the end of this week, so we're, we're praying that all, all would go well. Um, speaking of, of hurricanes, some have asked how we might be able su to support and to provide some support to those who have been negatively affected in North Carolina and parts of Georgia uh, through Hurricane Helene. Well, there is a way in which you might be able uh, to support. Uh, we're doing a special offering, taking up a special offering next Sunday for disaster relief. There have been some members who have already taken it upon themselves and they've gathered some supplies and they're already headed uh, to North Carolina to personally deliver some items. Um, but for you uh, who uh, might be here this morning, uh, there is a collection that we uh, ask that you would give to if the Lord moves you in such a way. Next Sunday, October 13th, uh, it's going uh, for or to Disaster Relief, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief, uh, who will be sending supplies and resources to the areas that have been negatively uh, impacted. But you don't have to wait until next Sunday. If you want to give and give today, uh, just and you're writing a check, just put in the memo part of that check, um, disaster relief. And there's also, if you give online, there's also a drop-down menu uh, that you can use and, and utilize if you want to give online. Uh, we've already sent some money, a considerable amount of money, but we want to do even more. That's the, uh, the type of church that you are part of. But you also might want to uh, physically do some things. Well, tomorrow uh, there is a volunteer opportunity for disaster relief uh, at Churches of Christ Disaster Relief uh, at 10 a.m. tomorrow, 410 Allied Drive in Nashville. That is tomorrow morning. Maybe you're off for the week and maybe you just have some time to spare. Maybe you just want to get involved. Well, that is your opportunity uh, tomorrow. We are in a series entitled Allegiance, where we've been studying the book of Daniel, understanding how to pledge our allegiance to God in a world that uh, asks us to pledge our allegiance to it. We want to stay faithful. We want to stay loyal to God. And walking chapter by chapter through Daniel, Daniel has been uh, illuminating, the Holy Spirit has been illuminating how we might stay uh, that faithful. We've been taking a chapter at a time. Uh, we have been in the series now four weeks, so that means we are in Daniel chapter number four today. So I invite you to get a Bible and go there. We're going to study most and uh, read most of the verses of this chapter. And I think God is going to blow your mind by the time we get to the end of it. He's going to teach us. He's going to show us exactly what we need to see uh, through Daniel chapter number four. And again, I think it's going to be something that blows your mind at the end. And, but as you turn there, I got a question for you. Have, has there ever been something that maybe 
you grew up hearing was a true fact. Later to find out that as you aged, as you got older, as you did research yourself, that that which you thought was true actually wasn't. Some things like this. We were told for a long, long time that bulls were uh, angered at the sight of the color red. Because the matador, we saw the matador in front of the bull waving the red cape, and the, and the bull got, got angry and, and started to charge ahead. So we were told that this statement was true. Bulls don't like the color red. Only to find out later that that's not true. As a matter of fact, bulls are colorblind. They don't even see the color red. And you might say, well, why are they so angry? Here's why they're angry, because they got a dude in front of them waving a cape, provoking them. I'd be angry too. We thought it was true, but it's not. Here's another statement that we thought was true. Our, our mothers always told us this, don't stay out in the rain too long. Because if you're out in the rain too long, you'll catch a, yeah, you'll catch a cold. But then doctors came out later and said, you know what? That's not true. You don't, get, uh, you don't catch a cold from the length of time you spend out in the rain. The cold is picked up because of a virus. I wish I had known that when I was a kid. But here's the big one. We thought it was true. It's not. The big one for me, the one I really wish I would have known about when I was a kid, is when people would say, don't give kids too much sugar. <laughs> because when you give them too much sugar, they start bouncing off the walls and they become hyperactive. I got news for you. I'm about to upset a whole bunch of parents in here right now. Here's the truth. Doctors say that's not true. They say that the amount of sugar, that's not what's increasing the hyperactivity in your kids. But you might say, but, but I've given them sugar and I've seen them bounce off the walls. The doctors would say the reason you think they're bouncing off the walls because of sugar is because you think the sugar is going to make them bounce off the walls. Go home and try that when you leave here today. Just, let, let, let's just see what happens, okay? Let's just, let's, just, let's just see what happens. Most of these things, church, most of these things, whether they're true or whether they're false, they don't really affect our lives all that much. It's not going to affect my life that a bull is colorblind and is not really going to see the color of a cape being waved in front of them. Why is that? Because I'm not getting in front of a bull waving any color of a cape. So it's not going to make much of a difference. But there are some truths in life that do make a difference. How you see God and the truth of who God is, the truth of God's power, the truth of His majesty, the truth of His glory, that matters. The truth of how you see God's Son, Jesus Christ the King, it matters. It matters for how you see life, for how you do life, for how you live life. In Daniel chapter number 4, you're going to see a king. The king that we've seen throughout the book of Daniel thus far, King Nebuchadnezzar. He's going to come face to face with a truth, a truth that for all of his life he has resisted. He's resisted this truth about who God is and what God has the power to do. He's resisted this truth because he has lived, grown up in a culture that has been resistant to God. He's grown up, he's lived in a culture, a polytheistic culture, a mini-God culture. He's seen life in a way that's opposite of what life really is. Life doesn't work 
quite the way that Nebuchadnezzar expects life to work. He's grown up with a twisted, philosophical, polytheistic view of life. But as we've seen, as we've studied the book of Daniel, the things that have happened in ancient Babylon, the setting of this book, aren't just confined to ancient Babylon. And such twisted thinking is, isn't confined to ancient Babylon either. This sort of twisted thinking also finds itself in modern-day Babylon, the world in which we live, the world that you live in that tends to be shaped and influenced by the loudest voices, by the most influential names and personalities. But here's the deal. The loudest voices aren't always the right voices. The most influential voices aren't always telling the truth. And unless we listen and learn to listen to the right voice, and unless we are able to drown out and filter out all of the noise of the world we live in and listen to God's voice, which is the right voice, we might end up with a similar twisted thinking the way you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar, his mind was shaped around. So in Daniel chapter number 4, here's what you're going to see. This, this chapter is written like a letter, a letter from Nebuchadnezzar to his empire. And he's going to start out by saying that where he is right now when he begins this letter is not where he has always been. Where he starts out with this letter, it's a very straight, a very clear way of thinking. He sees the world as it really is. He sees God as it really is. But in order to get there, he's going to tell you about an experience that he had, a dream that he had that led to an experience. And he had this experience because his thinking used to be twisted. But God used an experience and a dream to straighten out his twisted thinking. But he had to go through some stuff in order to get it straightened out. It's a text that's a little different. It's a text that takes us on a journey with a pagan king named Nebuchadnezzar. It's a text in which you see that the grace of God goes beyond what you and I might even imagine. You'll see God work with someone that you wouldn't dare think he would ever work with. But in it, you see God's love. In it, you see God's grace. And through it, you're going to see what God wants from you. And so before we read, let's pray. Lord, we bow down before the power of your word. Father, we know what your word can do. And so, Father, we ask right now that you would blow our minds, astound us through your word. Dear God, might your word come alive to us, all of us in here today. Everyone who's watching online, may the Word come alive to them. Might your Word be sharp enough to penetrate even the toughest hearts, the toughest hearts in here, the toughest hearts that are watching now, the toughest of hearts that will watch later. Might you be glorified through the proclamation and through the hearing and through the obedience of of your word, we surrender ourselves. In the name of Jesus, let us say amen. Daniel chapter number 4 is about 30 years following the events of Daniel chapter number 3. By the time we meet Daniel in this chapter, Daniel is a middle-aged man. We first met Daniel when he was a teenager. Now he might be near 50 years of age. 
King Nebuchadnezzar, when we first met him, we get the impression that he's early on in his reign and his rule over the dominant powerhouse Babylon. But where we meet him in chapter number four, Nebuchadnezzar is probably near the end of his life and most assuredly near the end of his reign. But Nebuchadnezzar is someone who is an interesting subject of Scripture. Nebuchadnezzar is someone that God has been trying to work with. He has been someone that God has been trying to teach lessons to, even though Nebuchadnezzar has twisted thinking. His twisted thinking is going to be paramount in this text today. So much so, we're going to call this lesson twisted thinking. But this twisted thinking hasn't been enough to make God back off of Nebuchadnezzar. God really wants to impress something upon the life and the heart of this king. He's been trying to show something to this king since the days when Daniel interpreted a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar. He's been trying to impress a truth upon Nebuchadnezzar's heart ever since he had seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego led out of the fiery furnace. He had been trying to show Nebuchadnezzar what I believe. He's still trying to show men and women today. He's, it's something he wants you to see. He wants you to see that he is the king of the universe. Amen. That he alone is sovereign. That he alone rules. And he's still trying to impress that upon your mind, my mind, the minds of everyone watching this today. God in heaven rules, and he rules all by himself. But it's something that Nebuchadnezzar hasn't been able to see or has resisted seeing. He understands that there is a God that the Hebrews call Jehovah. He understands that this God is a revealer of dreams and visions. He understands that this God occasionally steps down and delivers his people even out of a fiery furnace. But he can't see that this God is king of the whole universe. Thus, it's led to some twisted actions by Nebuchadnezzar. You know this, That what you think about determines how you behave. You know that. Say amen if you know that. What you think about, your thoughts determine your behavior. Well, for Nebuchadnezzar, his twisted thoughts have led to some twisted actions. And we're going to get to those twisted actions here in a minute. But before we get there, Nebuchadnezzar wants to tell you, here's where I am now. This is what I have come to see. I've actually come to see the truth of who God is. But then he's going to say, I haven't always been that way. Meet me at verse number one. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. King Nebuchadnezzar, he writes, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Kind of sounds like a letter that the Apostle Paul might have written. But he's writing a letter to his empire. He says, it has seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs. How mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And His dominion endures from generation to generation. I see right now, Nebuchadnezzar says, to my empire, I want you to understand, where I am, my thoughts on things right at the present time. Here are my thoughts. My thoughts is that God, Jehovah, is the Most High God. I've come to see that He's not just part of a pantheon of gods. He is the God. I've seen that, and I've seen that, Nebuchadnezzar says, because of what He's shown me. Signs and wonders and 
miracles. I've seen what he did for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But he's shown me some other stuff that I'm about to tell you about. And I've come to know. Here's what is true. That there is no God like Jehovah. I've come to know the truth that he is sovereign, that he reigns, and he reigns all by himself. And not only that, but he reigns and will continue to reign from generation to generation to generation to generation. But then he's about to say, but I haven't always felt that way. There was a time that I didn't, but I had an experience So it's almost like he calls his people. It's almost like he's calling you to himself right now. And he says, I haven't always been this way, but let me tell you. Let me tell you what happened to me. Drop down to verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house, prospering in my palace. And I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head, they alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. So it's, he's saying, come here, let me tell you this story. I was in my house, in my palace, and I was looking around at my palace And I was looking at all the good stuff that was in my palace. And I was saying to myself something like, man, life is good. And life doesn't really get any better than this. Look at all that I have around me. Look at at all that I have access to. And he goes to bed with this thought of the goodness of his palace, the goodness of his life. These are the thoughts that were on his mind when he laid down. But as he slept, a dream suddenly came into his mind. As he slept, the thought of how good life was was replaced by a dream. And it was a dream, being an ancient Babylonian, they wanted to know what dreams meant. They wanted a dream to be interpreted because in their mind, a dream was a signal. It was a sign of something that the gods were trying to deliver to them, a message that the gods were trying to teach them. And so he wants to know, like he wanted to know the interpretation of the dream earlier. And so he calls in. He calls in his magicians and his astrologers because his thinking at this time was twisted. So he brings in the magicians and the astrologers. The text will tell you, but they can't tell him what the dream means. Finally, he does something he likely should have done at the outset of having this dream. He calls in Daniel. And he says, verse number 8, at last Daniel came in before me, who was named, this is his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, after the name of my God, in whom Nebuchadnezzar has identified is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you and that no mystery is too difficult for you. Tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. You read that and you probably have the question yourself. Well, if Daniel is the chief of the magicians, if he knows that Daniel has the spirit of the holy God inside of him, If he knows that Daniel will be able to tell him the dream, why didn't he just call Daniel in the first place? Well, I believe it tells us something about his thinking. Now, maybe Daniel was out of town. Maybe he was watching the football game. We don't know what Daniel was doing of why he didn't call Daniel in. But I think it tells us something about Nebuchadnezzar's thinking. His thinking is twisted. 
even though he has every bit of evidence that there's something different about Daniel, he goes with his own guys. He goes with his boys. He goes with what he has known all his life. He goes with the magicians and he goes with the astrologers and he is telling himself in this moment, my way is the best way. We will always venture into twisted thinking. Listen to me, North Boulevard. If you believe your way is the best way, it will always take you down a pathway you don't want to go. Because if you know and you've seen evidence that there is a God in heaven and that he rules, how in the world is your way the best way? if he's in control. Well, Nebuchadnezzar might believe this, that his way is indeed the best way, but then he sees what we will always see, your way just simply doesn't work. And sometimes God will stir you up so that you have no choice but to see that your way doesn't work. Sometimes God might allow you to keep hitting the brick wall so that you finally wake up to the fact that your way doesn't work because it's twisted thinking. So he brings Daniel before him, and he understands Daniel can tell him the vision. And so in verse number 10, here's where we're going. He says, The visions of my head as I lay in bed were these, Daniel. I saw and behold a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew, became strong, its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field, they found shade under it, and the birds of the heavens, they lived in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. Here's where the dream begins, church. Nebuchadnezzar says, Daniel, I had a dream. In the dream, I saw a tree. But it wasn't just any sort of tree. It's a tall tree, mighty and majestic tree. Its top reached the heavens. It was so tall that everyone on the earth had no choice but to see the tree. It was a tree full of leaves, its branches stretched out wide. Beasts of the field would come and they would find shelter and shade underneath the tree. Leaves were so lush, offered so much protection. The birds of the sky, they found nest in the tree. But it wasn't just a majestic tree, it was a tree of produce produce fruit, food, so that people could come and dine underneath the tree. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture in what is so far a beautiful, beautiful dream. But then the dream changes into a nightmare. He goes on to say, I saw in the visions, verse 13 of my head, as I lay in bed, And behold, a watcher, a holy one, that's an angel, come down from heaven. And he proclaimed aloud and said, thus, chop down the tree, lop off its branches, strip off its leaves, scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. What you saw in the dream, the beautiful tree, life-giving tree, shade-giving tree, a tree where one could dwell, a tree where one could find protection, a tree like this, All of a sudden in the dream, that whole image is taken away. An angel comes down from heaven, 
says to someone, chop the tree down. Scatter everything that was related to the tree. Take away the leaves of the tree. The fruit that the tree gets, scatter that. Get rid of these birds, all the beasts that were under it. Get rid of them. Let it only be a stump. But guard that stump because I might let some growth come on that stump later. But everything that was beautiful, everything that seemed good, an angel came down and said, take it away. But this dream, this nightmare gets even worse Because now we're about to shift. We're shifting from the image of the tree to an image of a man, which lets us know that the tree this whole time represented one particular man. Look at verse 15 again. But leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, amid the tender grass of the field. Now watch the switch. Let him be wet With the dew of heaven. We were talking about a tree, now we're talking about a man. Let his portion be with the beasts in the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's, and let a beast's mind be given to him. And let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets over it the lowliest of men. This man who is center of this dream now, we learning that this man's mind would be changed. It would be twisted from a man's mind to a beast's mind. He would have the mind of an animal where he would go out and he would eat grass like an ox, twisted mind. He would be wet with the dew of heaven, twisted mind. Where he was at one particular time, now his mind is twisted and he thinks like an animal, and this would be, according to the dream, for seven periods of time. Seven periods of time, let me teach you this. Seven periods of time. Uh, within the Bible, we, we look at the number seven. We see that number seven come up quite a bit. And the number seven typically represents a complete period of time, a perfect period of time. And this time would be complete. It would be perfect until this person came to his senses and saw that there is no God like Jehovah. Until he saw that only the most high rules. Until he saw that God rules over the kingdoms, all of the kingdoms of the nations. Something that King Jehoshaphat, he came to see in Second Chronicles 20 and 6. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule. Your rule is not just in heaven, but you rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. I am thankful here today that there is no one on earth No one in the spiritual realms who can withstand, who can defeat our God. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that He is ruling all around us. And I'm thankful that He's never going to stop ruling, that He's going to rule from generation to generation. And that He is able to put Nebuchadnezzar in power, He's able to put even the lowliest of men in power. In other words, it doesn't matter who is in power because God is the power. Okay? I want you to know that, especially in the world and the time in which we live in. It doesn't matter who is in earthly power. What matters is that God is the power. It matters that He is on the throne. Regardless of who's in the White House, he's on the throne. Regardless of who's in the Senate, he's on the throne. 
And our allegiance is to the king of the entire universe. We pledge our allegiance to the United States of America, but our allegiance is to the king of the universe. He wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know something. He wanted Nebuchadnezzar to know what we have to know. You are not really in control. There are poems that are written that tell us that we are the masters of our fate and the captains of our own soul. But here's the truth. You're not in control because God is. And if you're in control, that means you haven't surrendered control to Him. And He just might Disturb your life enough so that you can untwist that type of thinking. Well, this is the dream that he has. And he wants Daniel to tell him the interpretation of this dream. Daniel doesn't want to do it because Daniel uh, perhaps is very close to Nebuchadnezzar by this time. He knows what this dream means. So buckle up, y'all. Here's where the dream comes in to focus. We're going to cover this relatively quickly, but uh, not too fast where you miss the meaning. Then Daniel, whose name, verse number 19, was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you, and its interpretation for your enemies. Daniel is saying, I know what the dream means. I really don't want to tell you what the dream means. Let the dream be in this interpretation be for your enemies, not for you. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar says, no, it's for me. Tell me what the dream means. Okay, verse 20. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, so that its top reached to heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and in which was food for all, under which beasts of the field found shade, and in whose branches the birds of the heavens lived. Here's what the tree is in your dream. It is you, O king, who have grown strong and become strong. Your greatness has grown and reaches to heaven, and your dominion to the ends of the earth. The first part of the dream you saw, that's you, Nebuchadnezzar. You're the tree. Your empire has spread all out like the branches on a tree. Your kingdom has provided shelter and shade for those who are in your kingdom, under your rule. You've uh, ruled in such a way they found fruit uh, fruit and food, and, and they found a place to dwell in your kingdom. But, Nebuchadnezzar, remember there was a second part of your dream. You saw an angel come down from heaven. Verse 23, because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stumps or the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field. But at the same time, you got to realize, you saw the angel, the angel said, chop down the tree. Here's what that means. Your reign is going to end. You're not always going to be the king. There's going to come a time in your life that you're not the king. And then you remember how the dream switched from a tree to that of a man. Let me get really, really personal with you. You also saw that uh, this man would be wet with the dew of heaven and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, and it is a decree from the Most High. God has given a decree upon your life, Nebuchadnezzar. He is going to do something to you. He's going to end your kingdom. He's going to drive you out from all mankind. He is going to do this until you see who he is. Verse 26, and as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom, you're going to get it back, shall be confirmed for you for the time that you know that heaven rules. The, the object of all of this 
is so that you understand that there is a God in heaven, that he rules over everything. He wants to show you, Nebuchadnezzar, in us today, you're not in control. God reigns, God rules, and God is sovereign. And then Daniel tells him, man, I hope this is not for you. I hope, I hope, I hope you don't have to go through this, though, Nebuchadnezzar. But so you don't, verse 27, therefore, the, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Take heed my advice, he's saying. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness in your iniquities, by showing mercy to the oppressed, that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. I want you to change the way you're thinking about life, Nebuchadnezzar. I want to bring you to the point of repentance. See, repentance is a change of heart, change of mind. It's a change in our thinking that changes our behavior. And Daniel is saying, maybe the Lord will stave off this, this, this dream if you come to the point of right thinking, straight thinking. But if not, this is in your future. And, and maybe God hasn't done it already simply because he's trying to get you to the point of repentance. He's already shown you some stuff in your life. See, church, I hope you hear me on this one. Maybe God has shown you some stuff already in your life, and he's waiting for you to come to the right way of thinking. He wants you to see who he really is and who you are in comparison to who he is. He's being patient. People ask often, well, I see so much evil in the world. If there's a God in heaven. Why isn't God doing something about the evil that's in the world? Well, God is doing something about the evil in the world. God will act in the future on that evil. He will act, but he's acting now, and he's acting through his patience. Peter says it like this in 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. He will judge, but right now he's patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Daniel is trying to bring them to repentance, but repentance is something that Nebuchadnezzar is going to resist. Have you ever said about someone, they brought it on themselves? You know, you brought it on yourself. Nebuchadnezzar is about to bring all of this on himself. God gives him a year to repent, but he does it. Here's how I know it. Drop down to verse number 28. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. The king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my Majesty, I, my, my, me, my, I, I did it. I'm looking at Babylon, and he's looking at Babylon from street level. He's, he's, at, he's in the, uh, what some believe are the hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And he looks at Babylon, and he says, I did it. He looks at Babylon and says, this is for my majesty. This is for my glory. And then he brought it on himself. He brought the dream, and put the dream into motion. Verse 31, while the words were still in the king's mouth, and when he was talking about my eye and I, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet 
with dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were as long as bird's claws. He sees now that the dream has become a reality. His twisted thinking, God twisted it even more because God wanted something from Nebuchadnezzar that he wants from you. He wants our allegiance but he expects something else. He expects our humility. He expects us to know that it's him who rules. And that takes a humble spirit. A spirit to say, God rules. I must be able to say God rules, but at the same time, I'm saying I don't. At the same time, I say, God is my king. It's a simultaneous acknowledgement that I am not king. He wants your allegiance, but he expects your humility because of who he is and because of who you are. He expects it. And he's looking for it. And there's blessing in humility. Isaiah says it like this, Isaiah 66 and 2. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You think about all the things that God has made in this life that you have seen. Some of you have traveled to the Grand Canyon. You've seen that. God made that. Some of you, you've been to the Rocky Mountains, been, been hiking through the mountains. God made that. You've been to national parks, Yosemite and others. You've seen what God has made. God made that. You've been in foreign lands. You've been in foreign countries. Maybe you've gone on cruises and you've seen the oceans, but God made all of that. All of it's beautiful. All these things my hand has made. It's like God is looking at his creation and saying, look at this. And he can say, I made it. But you know what, what God loves seeing? As beautiful as a mountain is, you know what's even more beautiful? When he looks at somebody who's humble. Now that, that's what he loves looking at. When he sees a, a man who's humble and contrite in spirit and who's trembling at his word because they know how powerful his word is. Oh, God loves that. As beautiful as the most beautiful or picturesque scene that you've ever seen on this planet. As beautiful as that is. God did, in fact, make that. But what astounds, if I might be able to use that word, what sets him back, what he just loves to see is a man and a woman walking in humility underneath him. Because I'm not going to walk in allegiance to God if I'm not first walking in humility before God. Nebuchadnezzar seeing what James said, James 4 and 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And when people, when you see people refuse to repent, their thinking is twisted. And Nebuchadnezzar's thinking is twisted. And he's uttered these words, I have done all of this. Let me tell you, North Boulevard, before you walk out of here, learn this lesson, the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar needed to learn. Never steal God's glory. It belongs to him and him alone. You didn't do it. He allowed you to do it. You got food on your table. It wasn't because you went to Kroger and Publix and bought it. God gave it to you. Don't steal his glory. The money that gets directly deposited in your account, oh, I earned that. You got it because God is so good. Never steal his glory. Nebuchadnezzar did. Now he's, he's eating, eating grass like an animal because he's looked at very high level of what he has done. And now God set him on eye level. He set him down. And now he's eating this grass. And he's eating this grass until a certain point in time. Verse 34, as we bring this to a close, at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised Him and honored Him who lives forever. I saw reality, and I didn't see reality. I was eating this grass, and I didn't see reality until the text says, 
he looked up. When he looked up, his reason returned. See, when he was looking at everybody else on eye level, he was thinking, he had twisted thinking, he thought he did some of that. But he looked up and maybe he had a thought of, there's no way I did that. There's no way I could have done anything of that nature. There was a moment of clarity. His reason came back to him. His thinking was straightened out, but it happened after he looked up North Boulevard, learned to look up. Learn to keep looking up. When you are in despair, maybe when you're having a moment of weak faith, when your mind might be twisted in that moment, when you might be discouraged, learn to look up. Because there's a message for you as you look up. Because you're seeing a sight that you couldn't do. Only God could have done that. Only he could have put that sun in that sky. Only he could have hung those stars in the sky. Only he could have painted a picture like that. And that's the one you've got to learn to depend on. And humble yourself under. James also, or Peter said in 1 Peter 5 and 6, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God so at the proper time he may exalt you. He will lift you up. And he lifted up Nebuchadnezzar. After the part of praise in verse 36, at the same time my reason returned to me, for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right, his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Now he sees who God is, but he was brought to a point of humility. We don't have to wait to that point. We can see who God is today. And we don't have to have a dream to straighten out our thinking or to connect us with God. We have a Savior. We have King Jesus who's come to lead us into what truth actually is. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes, no one is connected to the Father except through me. And our surrender to Jesus now is how we humbly walk in our allegiance before God. But you've got to straighten out your thinking enough to see who Jesus is. The more and more you pay attention to what God has done, the more you see who Jesus is. And the more you may let him, you will allow him to take you into connection with God. That's the best way to live life. There's one thing I want you to remember, it's this. God wants your allegiance, but he expects your humility. Here's what I want you to obey. Walk in humility. Well, how do we do it? You walk in humility by walking in obedience and faith and allegiance to Jesus Christ. It's what he wants from every single one of you. You have that opportunity now. You have that opportunity uh, later today, hopefully. But take advantage of the opportunity that's before you right now. Walk in humility. Walk in allegiance before King Jesus. Let's stand and sing.